Good afternoon, uh, Madame Tubiana, Ambassador Lorkowski, my dear students, uh, colleagues. Uh, I would like to say that uh, for us at the College of Europe, as you know, the environment and climate, climate uh, is one of focus areas, as you can see, uh, climate transition lecture series at Natalin, which we started one year ago uh, with the opening uh, with Madame Espinoza, UNFCCC Executive Secret uh, Secretary. So it's my pleasure and honor uh, to uh, open today and to welcome Madame Tubiana, who uh, accepted uh, our invitation uh, to give a lecture to our students, and she also agreed uh, to um, talk with us uh, during uh, question and answers uh, session, which is to be moderated by uh, Ambassador Lorkowski, um, the Poland's uh, special envoy to COP. Uh, 2024. Um, but today's address will be delivered by Madame Lawrence Tubiana. Um, we know uh, Madame Tubiana is one of the most uh, influential persons in the topic, uh, for sure in Europe. Uh, Madame Tubiana is the CEO of the European Climate Foundation, president of the French Development Agency Board of Go Governors. She was France Climate change ambassador one, and one of the main architects of COP21 and the founder of the Institute for Sustainable Development and International Relations. Last but not least, uh, uh, she is professor of international uh, relations in Sciences Po uh, Paris and uh, Columbia University. And obviously she has a long record of top level experiences and achievements in the field of um, development, however, specifically in climate. Dear Madame uh, Tubiana, I am, I am really very glad and honored to welcome you at the College of Europe. I know that these turbulent times uh, didn't allow us uh, to welcome you in person, but still I do believe that uh, better times will come and uh, we will be able to welcome you at our campus. I rely very much on on that. Um, so, Madame uh, Tubiana, the floor is yours, and, uh, and then a um, session moderated by uh, Ambassador Lorkowski and uh, you, dear students, you will be able to ask questions and discuss with our guest of honor today. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mrs. Director General of the College of Europe. And thank you, my dear former colleague, Ambassador Lovkowski. I'm very happy to see you again. And very excited for this opportunity to exchange with you, students. Of course, I am frustrated not to be here with you. I hope very soon uh, we can break this isolation. And, and thanks to Zoom, at least, we have a connection. Uh, your institution is a very important one in particular in those moments, very important moments at European and global, at European level and global level. Because you prepare the future European leaders at a critical time for Europe, with after many ups and downs of the European project. You are at the same time looking inward, remaking the economy for the future with the European Green Deal, and at the same time as well, looking outward, defining a new place for Europe on the world stage. And I must say that climate change is certainly one of the topics where Europe has taken a real a seat at the table on the global world stage from many years. And the Natalin campus is really important for future Europe leaders to take out of Brussels, which I think is very, very necessary to be in contact with the politics and the policy of many of the member states. I just want to signal that I'm sensitive to the battles that many women like me and men in Poland these days are trying to defend and speak out for women's rights. Uh, and as a, a woman and of course a partisan of the really the ability for women to, to control their, their life, uh, I'm thinking of them, as I am thinking of many of you young students, uh, women students, uh, and I hope you will continue this 
progression of men in the diplomatic, political, intellectual life, as we have seen in the past years. But you have to go on. A lot of things has to be done still. Sorry. Um, so trying not to be too long, because I, I would like to take this opportunity to uh, really um, exchange with you. Uh, but we are at a critical moment for climate. Uh, because of this deep crisis, this health crisis, but this economic and social crisis, which is looming on us, which is on with us. Uh, and at the same time, we are in the decade, at the beginning of that decade, which will be crucial to really uh, have a, keep a serious chance to maintain temperature below two degrees C uh, by the end of the century. And in order to make the transition we need, which is a really a big transformation of our economies, everyone needs to be involved. And that's why I was very interested of the topic that uh, the College of Europe proposed me to, to deal with, which is a combination of, of course, governance on climate change, European role, but at the same time, understanding the links with democracy and the role of citizen. <clears throat> uh, because it's not about just top-down decisions, uh, in this uh, enormous transformation to go to net zero emission by 2050, when we can come back to that. Uh, we need, again, as I said, every need to be involved. And this includes, uh, inclusive approach, unfortunately, which is necessary, is not the way that many of our institutions classically work and operate. In fact, normally government and its public institution are by, for historic reasons and sometimes design, are more elite institutions, sometimes closed institutions, sometimes processes that can be understood by citizens, and have sometimes proponent power through resources because of access. And this is a big problem for our society. And because we need this transition to have the citizen buying the transition and supporting it and seeing what the future can look like for them, we can't imagine that this can happen in a peaceful way, in a cooperative way, if there is uh, not this um, inclusion of all groups. And I don't know, I'm, I don't know if you share my view, but when you exclude group from policy processes, this leads to inadequate, inadequate policy framework. And such policies, in a way, are, the, are really destined to fail. So. I would first, in my first part of my comment, I will deal with this immense challenge to uh, involve citizens in the decision making and the design of the policies, just to prevent uh, mistrust, resentment, and anti expert and anti elite sentiment and populism that really can bring the system to a breakdown. And for Having this, tackling this global issue, which is climate change, we really need to have a system that is functional, active, and agile. So my first part will be on this involvement of citizen and sharing an experience I had in France recently. I was co-chairing the, um, the Citizen Assembly for Climate Change, which was a, a, a sort of a response to the, um, the mov movement of the yellow vest, the gilet jaune grassroots movement that took place in 2019 against a plan to increase the tax on diesel and petrol. The so tax was a plan, was part of the plan of the climate policy in France, and it was not well received by the citizen. So it was a reasonable goal to raise that tax, but it did not take into account what would mean for people for whom the price of transport fuel was a very important monthly cost. It was a policy that was not designed with social impacts in mind. It was only the technical uh, in, impact in mind. So thousands of people came together on social media and then to the street to protest. It grew to include many people with limited resources from whom this tax felt like an unfair burden. And I insist on the unfair piece because that was mainly the reason why the protest erupted. So people felt excluded by an elite decision-making process and disadvantaged by their outcome. And that's true that in some cases, in this case in particular, um, growing the, the rate of the tax was uh, making an un putting an unfair burden on more 
modest household, and of course, the, their energy spending more important relatively to their income. So to respond to that sentiment of not to be seen, that's why the yellow vest puts their yellow vest, um, just to be seen. Um, a, a citizen assembly was decided a legislative process bringing together 150 randomly selected citizen representative of the French population for seven weekends over six months and hearing about more than 130 experts. That was designed to give citizens an opportunity to propose informed policy recommendation for addressing climate change in a socially just and equitable way. Ultimately, this citizen proposed 150 measures and policy proposal on housing, transport, agriculture, consumption, industry, health, biodiversity for the European national, for the European national and local level, and to propose reform of the French constitution. What it has accomplished is a clear a denial of the prejudice of that citizens are not interested in public affairs. They are. Uh, so being sceptical at first, the members quickly became strongly committed and enthusiastic. And there was an impressive personal investment of each member, heavy learning. They were working really such long weekends and over and over at home. And they had a keen sense of the responsibility incumbent on them. And the, then the inclusive discussion a very high quality deliberation and a judgment very close to the public interest. That was the result of this exercise. So this is a work of great democratic value, which is due to the power of collective intelligence, but also the procedure set and to the expertise provided. In reality, what they propose is very similar to what the High Council on Climate Change, which is uniquely formed by specialists and scientists proposed for the French, to the French government. And in their own way, the citizen finally fa produced a response that was very consistent with this very high level body, uh, which exists in France now since one year and a half. And it, it was a good exit from the top of the cycle of distrust manifested in Gilets Jaunes. So what do we conclude from this? If you, if you give space for citizen and information, uh, that, is really aspiration for citizens to change. And social and economic progress can no longer be an afterthought of energy transition policy design. You have to put the social, uh, the social and the, the justice at the core of the process at the start. And there is many forms can be invented and tested to recreate common sense and common uh, and common production. And I do think that deliberation and participation should not be confined to government only, uh, because again, faced with the challenge of the economic and social crisis and the necessary development of a low carbon strategy, we, uh, and the dialogue with companies or stockholders, we need this form of more open discussion and, and in a way the way that our representative democracy is connected with more deliberative democracy. In my view, we are at a turning point at EU level, and which, in a way, EU now as a political body and as an idea, uh, we need much more ownership and involvement of citizens in EU decision. And this is why I think the opportunity of the Green Deal, as well as the climate goal for 2030 and 2050, is a unique opportunity to create this space for citizens. I do think that now that we have a Green Deal project in Europe, and I will come back to that later, um, we have to make sure, and that was certainly the mistrust of many citizens of Europe vis-à-vis -vis the European institution, which is a classical topic you, you are certainly dealing with constantly in your college. So how we address the fact that Europe seems to be very far away uh, and only producing top-down decisions that, we are not co that are not connected with a daily concerns and, uh, and the concerns of the different citizens of this big ensemble we are to 27 member states. So how we make sure that the transition we are talking about, affect, which affects everyone, includes the whole of society, how to address the feeling and the fact that citizens are being excluded from the decision-making process. For example, 
And when I look at the Polish situation, you have seen, we have all seen a very vocal reaction by Silesian coal workers at the prospect of coal failure, which is, of course, a necessity in going to uh, reaching zero emission by 2050 in Europe. That's a similar cry to the Gilets jaunes. It asks, what about the effect of the transition on me, on us? So we have to involve this community in the discussion and local communities across Europe, Poland, UK, France, Belgium, have innovated a lot to find ways to include citizens in their planning. And many of them are continuing this effort, especially when dealing with specific challenges for rural areas or for regions more dependent on fossil fuels. I think it's very important because one, it allows us to learn from each other, but because in a way, uh, all this very positive developments I am seeing and witnessing at European level, and we'll come back to the outside influence, the global influence of Europe these days because of this, cannot be, will not happen if, there is, if it's seen as a bureaucratic exercise and not something that is embedded in societies. We have seen a new global wave of net zero commitment. China in September committed to carbon neutrality by 2060 Monday, Japan, and then today, Korea, have joined with a commitment for 2050. And the EU, of course, have committed for carbon neutrality by 2050 with a new interim goal of reduction of at least 55% by 2030, which I expect will be co confirmed in December. So in order to get there, we need more than a high-level commitment from head of state. It must be an exercise of whole level of society. It's not just about what we traditionally think of a governance or political institution. It means about the transformation of our economic and society. Uh, so this is really uh, everything will be made of people decisions, their behavior, that they will not go down the road if we all be for nothing. So. The EU has proposed a plan that imagines this whole society, whole economic transition. This is a European Green Deal. It was proposed by the European Commission in December 2019. It's a roadmap for making the European Union economic sustainable and reaching net zero by 2050. It covers all sectors of the economy, as well as support to help people and regions affected by this transition. It's the first time that Europe has such a comprehensive plan that goes across all the sector of economic activity, including the finance, uh, the finance. So it's a good thing climate is no more uh, longer siloed. It's a cross-cutting issue, which is evident, of course, for all of you, and every sector has to contribute to. But it's a new approach as well to European policy making. Because it's cross-cutting, and comprehensive, uh, it is a line around agreed upon common goals. This notion of agreeing common goal is really important because in a way, even within the EU institution, you have of course a number of actors playing. And I insist on that because I will come back to that with the conception of the Paris Agreement. When you can't control everybody, hopefully not, uh, the, the more important thing for governance, for healthy governance, in my view, is to align people and institutions around agreed upon common goals. And that is really important because that can let every institution, every level of society, decide their own ways and, of course, insisting on consistency and coordination. But you don't elaborate a top down systems that will in a way fall on everyone's shoulders. It's a contrary, it's a giving agency to every level of people, citizen, institutions to go for that goal. So the goal setting is absolutely crucial in my view in the governance of these days. And it can't be a bureaucratic process. It has to be embedded in society. In a way, on this point of view, the Green Deal has to be created now at national level, but even as well as local level. And I see that some cities in Poland already are working on that direction. I think it's a major achievement and historic moment for Europe, because again, it puts social justice at the core 
of, of all economic transformation. It creates solidarity, even more solidarity between uh, European countries, and in a way trying to invest for the future. And of course, it's a major transformation. And again, for particularly in the country you are living here for the moment, uh, it, it is really a huge challenge. And, and uh, that's why I think the concept of the just transition uh, is really a core concept to make this Green Deal real. I not, we, we can have the more discussion because I'd like to cover other issues now. Um, I think, but again, because we are in a school that where covenant is a central issue of your studies, I do think that it's not always about outcomes we should be concerned with. Uh, we have to arrive at them, of course, we have to look for outcomes, we have objectives, and we try to, of course, choral attitude, behaviors towards these objectives. But more importantly, it's the way we bring citizens, we bring institutions in the transition, is the process itself. So, so there is, of course, a substantive rationality. We have to push for the objective, the substance of the, what we are looking for, in this case, fighting, combating climate change. But the democratic process we are elaborating to get there is as important as the outcome. So when we design the transition for social justice and inclusiveness, this is a way how we design the process is really important. So how we can make this transition in spirit of social justice, how we move quickly forward without leaving anyone behind, and how we can, even more importantly, or as importantly, can we reform our policy processes for inclusion. <clears throat> so let's see how people can see themselves in the in the transition how they can see the benefit for them and then can I, can imagine their future in this transition and um, again combating the mistrust of citizens vis-a-vis uh, their elected institute their elected representative of their institution so that's why there is a particular interesting project from the EU side that tried to decentralize the discussion of the Green Deal and get citizens involved in the, this, in the setting of this major project that will take certainly the next 10 years to be achieved. So what I see at least going in the right direction is that not only, of course, there is this need and this feeling that we have to involve the citizen, but I see already in Europe vis-a-vis -vis this Green Deal that uh, already economic actors, major companies, for example, investors and shareholders have already uh, progressed in the vision of being to net zero, trying to develop the transition plan to net zero, and meaning that and there was many voices uh, from many places, uh, companies in different parts of Europe that have said, we, we want this Green Deal, we want this to be actively implemented uh, because fighting climate change is really a major endeavor because climate change is a major risk. So this per common perception of the risk as well as this common objective of the net zero goal, which is now beginning to be in a way the load star, of the activities of climate change and climate action uh, is now shared in a very decentralized way. It's not only an objective formulated again by EU institution or head of states at the European level. It's something that is distributed among the society and of course not only in Europe, but globally. I'd like now to come to my third point, having linked this example of the democratic process and, the, and its concern in France, uh, the, the feelings that the Green Deal needs European citizens to be, in a way, put in place for real. I'd like to co focus now on the climate policy making in Europe and uh, its impact on international governance. As you know, the climate diplomacy is, has a long story in Europe. Um, perhaps it's the only topic where EU has been consistent uh, from the start. 
and uh, negotiating, of course, the treaty in 1972-92 of the United Nations Framework Convention to Combat Climate Change that Patricia Espinoza certainly described you when she, you listened to her. Uh, but beyond the negotiating the signing of this treaty, uh, that was really the perception of Europe being a very, very active actor uh, at every level of the European governance ministers of environment first because they were the most concerned when climate finally was perceived as the only an environment issue at that time in 1992 and to head of states of government were uh, progressively involved in the climate diplomacy and when you look at the story of the conference of the party of the new NFPLC, you see major milestones who have taken place in europe good ones and bad ones Copenhagen, of course, in all memories, but Berlin, 1995, a very important date. Warsaw, Katowice, Bonn, Paris, Madrid, Rome, etc. Most big cities in Europe have taken place and have played a role in shaping the governance of climate change. Uh, as you know, climate uh, has an hybrid model in the EU governance. It's shared between, differently from trade, it's shared between the Commission and the Member State Authority. It's a shared responsibility. And of course, as usual, the Commission has a, a lot of expertise, a lot of technical capacity, but it's always a joint activity between the bilateral diplomacy of all Member States, in particular, of course, of the Presidency of the Union uh, at, at every moment. And at the same time, of course, the EU diplomacy. And that's very interesting to, to witness. And I, I can say as a, first, uh, as a first testimony of it, the capacity on this particular topic to really have an aligned policy outside. On climate change, all ambassadors of EU member states meet and coordinate their action vis-a-vis -vis the third party. There is really a common understanding and sharing of information. And uh, that means that there is a very sophisticated multi-bilateral approach on the EU diplomacy and the and EU discussion uh, at global level for climate. It's very original. You don't see that in many other topics of the European governance. Trade is really different. Uh, and I see many other issues where, where you don't see that sophisticated mechanism. And this sophisticated mechanism giving really a voice uh, a Europe to Europe. And you have seen that very, very strongly at different key moments. Berlin mandate where Chancellor Merkel, well, she was not the chancellor at that time, uh, just uh, launched the Kyoto Protocol until after Paris, when uh, the, the President of the United States decided to withdraw from the Paris Agreement in 2017, who picked up the ball? Uh, in Kyoto Protocol, when the US decided to withdraw, or after Paris in 2017, when the US decided to withdraw again, who picked the ball to maintain the flame, to maintain the energy? Europe. And even be playing a growing role in the capacity to convene other major players around, around Europe to continue the efforts in this, in this period in particular to follow and to really implement Paris Agreement and to maintain political energy around it. As an example, I can tell you that after you may know that uh, traditionally US starting by the George Bush administration, has launched a, a sort of club of major emitters, different names along the time, but uh, more recently, before the withdrawal, the major economic forum led by US was a way to, in a way, to organize the major emitters around the issue of climate change. And you may know the G20, uh, which of course represents the same countries, uh, it's not a particularly easy place where you discuss climate change when finally you discuss mostly security, economy and trade. So the US left, uh, left the ball drop and Europe, for example, pick it up together with China and Canada 
with a new setting which they call the MOCA. And uh, around, of course, this climate action idea. So meaning uh, Europe was not only able to coordinate itself and to play a, in a way a guiding role in all the processes of the climate governance, but at one, at one stage, and particularly after Paris, being able to reach out to the major player to continue and in a way show climate leadership. So now we are in a phase where we, on one side, we are designing the climate law of Europe and certainly that would lead to corresponding uh, <clears throat> laws in member state. Uh, we will have, of course, a number of discussion on how this net zero emission, the, this target, uh, and, uh, and of course, the connection between the domestic policy and the global policy uh, for, for climate governance. Uh, has now an impact on trade, and you may want in the discussion to deal with the carbon, the carbon border adjustment tax, the reform of the emission trading system, all which so shows that not only EU has rise, risen to a status of global leadership on climate, which I can <clears throat> come back again, but really is now set. <clears throat> and we see this example in the last week, that Asia following EU announcement, finally seen, starting by China. But I think now the linkage between trade regime and climate regime will be more and more obvious. And that will be, of course, the initiative on the European side to start that discussion. <clears throat> finally, I'd like to tackle the international climate governance and what I argue for polycentrism as a solution. Um, you know, as because I started by inclusion and collective action towards a solution uh, for global problems, um, uh, this is not new for climate governance. And in fact, after many years of failures, we brought this approach of inclusive and collective action together to the design of the successful Paris Agreement. When I designed the Paris Agreement, I envisioned an hybrid model between a top-down and a bottom-up approach. And Paris, for me, was, in a way, supported by four pillars. The framing, the, of course, the overarching legal text, we need an agreement, but we need that was a top-down element. But we need national, unilaterally decided climate plans, with, of course, written in the legal text, a peer review, a peer pressure organization. But my third pillar was uh, on finance, because we needed the finance to shift to funding fossil fuel activities, the base of our economy of the 20th century, to shift from this to a new one. And the fourth one was a non-set actor's role, because I felt, again, as I said in the beginning, that if you could share common objectives, then you can adopt a decentralized uh, mode of governance in the climate regime. And the climate regime has to be complex. You have studied certainly some major texts of international relation. We know that the climate regime cannot be a centralized one. It's a complex regime, as many good authors said, and that's why, building on that conceptual theory, uh, I set up this idea of we need these different pillars to work towards Paris results. So Paris Agreement, in my view, is not only the legal text, but it is the combination of the national climate plan, the non-set actors' commitment, and the financial institutions supporting all this movement. So the, for me, the theory of change of the Paris Agreement is about changing expectation and about engaging all actors. Why expectation? Because you know better than everybody else that in international governance, we don't have uh, enforcement mechanisms that are very strong. Uh, we, can't, we will never invade a country because it's not, this country is not uh, fulfilling its uh, climate targets, for example. So we, we need peer pressure, but we need mechanism of enforcement. And my view, which is in social science well known, the best mechanism of enforcement is really to shape the expectation for the future. And this has then has a consequence, um, a behavior change that can entail behavior change. But for that, we need 
that all actors share that or are involved or understand and see, feel that they participate to and set their own plans. As we were negotiating Paris, it was clear that non-state actors were forced to be reckoned and engaged with local authorities, cities, region and state, businesses, um, including investors, were particularly key. And we encourage countries to adopt the global climate deal and make sure that concerns were addressed. But for example, direct access to finance from lo for local authorities, for example, competitiveness. These actors took commitments of their own to reduce their GHG emission, and they bring that to Paris at that time to improve resilience to climate change or mobilize climate finance and divest from high carbon assets and invest in low carbon technology development and innovation. So in the lead up to Paris and during the negotiation, there was a contribution, we, we call them contribution to the Paris Agreement package, adding up, up to over 10,000 commitments explicitly recognized, encouraged and organized within a formal, what we have established as an institution, the climate action agenda. Subnational government are the one who need to translate and implement the content of the agreement to their own context. Their commitment to doing their part to reduce GHG emission was a crucial piece in the overall puzzle. But it served as well as a safety net, one that I didn't expect, frankly, to be tested as quickly at, as it was, but one that worked. When President Trump announced his intention to exit the US from Paris Agreement, there was immediately a huge move by US states, cities, business, university, and investors. Uh, and more to say, we are still in. This move had been very significant from a governance point of view. I expect it to continue no matter what the outcome of next week's election. But the role of non-state actors in the preparation, negotiation of the Paris Agreement is worth highlighting as a real innovation in terms of global governance. The idea was to overcome the challenge of including enforcement mechanisms in multilateral environment agreements often explained by state attachment to and protection of their sovereignty, which is a key notion we have to think and rethink all the time, and rely on the potential of non-state actors to act as powerful levers of implementation. Associating non-state actors as observers to the design of international agreement or even as implementers was not an innovation on its own, since the first UN Environment and Development Conference in 1992, known as the Earth Summit, nine major groups of stakeholders participate in different ways to the UN process, women, children, youth, indigenous people, business industry, etc. But of course, it's more an observing role. Now in Paris, we were, they were given a much more active and central role in the development of the Paris Agreement itself that they did in many other international processes. And they have been uh, incredible drivers in the process. The momentum built up in the year before Paris with the launch of initiatives, so the Renewable 100 campaign, the science-based target, business were working with national government, joint launch of the American Business Act on Climate Change pledge by the Obama administration, many, many more cities, etc. So it's really important. And of course, um, I see uh, in the future of the design of the global governance, we have to invent the new DNA of this governance where non-state actors are given a particular seat at the table and not only as observers, but as real contributors. I think we're getting there, but of course we need a formalization of that and institutionalization of this approach. So governance matters enormously, processes, inclusion, recognition of a decentralized governance. But at the same time, and would like to finish by this, politics matter. And we have seen a lot of headwinds against Paris Agreement when it was signed up. It, was a very, it is a very ambitious agreement. The global goal to get to net zero globally by 2050 or soon after, turning all the finance to support the green uh, development, having uh, really uh, the conservation of natural resources as a core center of the Paris Agreement as well. Uh, everything shows that, and, and this cycle that every five years, countries have to come back with better plans, more aligned with the long term. By 2020, and certainly now shifting to 2021, 
countries have to come with better, more ambitious climate plan and long-term strategy to get to net zero. This consistency in policies, this uh, insistence of having a clear pathway, a clear plan, is something very new in the global governance arena where uh, it's more negotiation about tax and processes. This is a combination of processes and of course formal text with object, concrete objective and real economy direction with planning and as, at the same time processes, substance and procedures. So a lot of lessons has to be learned. For students like you, I would like to, to tell you that to negotiate well, and I'm sure Ambassador Lorkowski will agree with me, you need a theory, you need concept as well as practice. It's not about just the nitty gritty of the diplomatic, the power politics, the negotiation of uh, really very interest of every country. It is about that. It is about power politics. We have, of course, major player and geopolitics playing. But at the same time, it's in a way embedded global goals to a whole society. And that's why I think we have to enlarge to broaden the spectrum of global governance to have citizen because it's about their future, much more involved, together with many stakeholders in the design of this process. I think it's sometimes too big for government, but it is really at the dimension of the human societies. So I will let this there. I'm very happy to have your views and questions. Thank you very much for your excellent lecture, combining both the theory and the practice of international relations. And yeah, we, we, we are very happy today having this opportunity hearing to, the, to somebody who is, uh, who is representing both of these capabilities and qualities in these both areas. Now I would like to open the floor for students for some questions to be taken. Um, uh, so if you are... Uh, Ready to ask any question, please, now is the time for, for, for doing that. Please go ahead. You have, I think you, you, you need to have mic, right. First of all, thank you, Madam Tubiano, for the very interesting presentation. Um, I would like to go back to your previous topic about uh, involvement of citizens in the process in the European um, Union and about uh, coming up with a climate, um, climate answer and a uh, just climate uh, response. You talked about the involvement um, and how, and we all know about the European Climate Pact, for example, that's got the, the opinions of uh, European citizens. However, I'm, I'm afraid I have to disagree that that opinion is being taken into account because what we still see is that we still see European Union funding fossil fuels. We see the fossil fuel lobbying still very present in EU. And now we have the tobacco, f um, the tobacco lobbying ban because it's proven to be bad for health. The fossil fuel lobbying is not banned and it's increasing. And I don't think it's fair that uh, all the money that goes into fossil fuel has to be co uh, competing with the involvement of citizens that don't have as much means to influence the Union as that. So I'd like to ask you if you think it is, it is a fair competition and if both sides are represented in the same way and if, if it's indeed realistic to talk about uh, the influence of citizens in this process. Thank you. Thank you very much. My proposal would be to take one question answered directly after that. You know, to, that would be easier from the, you know, from the organization, organizational point of view. Please, um, if you would offer us your, your comment on this question. Oh, thank you. So, uh, please, yes, of course. Um, I don't think so. I, I agree with you. It's not a given. Uh, citizen voices for the moment are needed if we want the Green Deal really to happen. But, of course, it's a... Uh, I would comment that it just, it, there is a strong competition. And, of course, the power, asymmetry of power is still very big. When you see uh, the campaigns of the oil and gas industry these days, uh, including when the European Investment Bank uh, decided and the board decided to stop the lending for fossil fuel projects. There was, of course, a huge campaign against that. So, yes, you're right. There is an asymmetry of power. 
Yes, uh, we have to make the citizens of Europe voices heard with putting in cl clearly to the government that that's the condition to make this happen. It will not happen. There will only be resistance and, and protest if they don't give that place. Uh, and so we need the process to be right. We don't have them at European level. Of course, we can have them. And, and in different countries, there was some, uh, some, some initiatives. I see what happened in Ireland. Uh, sometimes Germany, I know you have been, there will be citizen involvement in some consultation and delibera deliberation in Poland, but at local level, if I remember well. Uh, there was there is another one running now in Spain very soon. So there are uh, essays in some of the member states. I think one we should encourage. But second, it would be really interesting in your particular school, you think about what could be a real process of engaging citizen uh, in the in the discussion of European policy and the design of European policy. For the moment. It's a very classical. Uh, it's a very classical um, processes of a vague consultation and not really uh, uh, something that really has an impact on the policy making. But I think we could we could invent that. We have to invent that, and it's a formal opportunity now because the um, the Commission has decided to to really open the debate on the, the Green Deal at a citizen level. But I'm not sure they have the governance right. So that's why I think it would be very good if you come with suggestion and forcefully, because again, I agree with you, uh, the asymmetry of power, of course, is still there and citizens have to organize themselves to, to in a way rebalance that. Okay, thank you very much. I've seen you might have question. Please go ahead. Merci beaucoup uh, pour votre présence. Uh, I will ask my question in English. Uh, the Green Deal is probably the best package created to like, aim at the climate transition. Nevertheless, it's not enough, and it's really, really far from the goal, as like a lot of strong choices are not made. I uh, could talk about the importance, for example, of the nuclear power, but my question will be about climate transition linked to economic transition. We know that GDP growth is strongly linked to the use of energy. How can we aim for zero net emission without leaving the goal of EU uh, economic growth? We know that the reduction of energy won't be enough as it will lead to more production. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, merci beaucoup pour votre question. Um, is it sufficient, but that's still to be demonstrated how we go far on the different pieces, uh, in particular the strong pieces of the common agricultural policy, for example, again, the, this, the transition on clean energy, the transport, there are many things to be done, but we, we have some elements in there, I think. So it's the best one we have, but of course we have to push the ball further. This problem of the connection between economic growth and emissions uh, which is basically the use of energy. How we can, can we decouple that? Well, yes, in a way, we, we see in a number of um, European countries, we have seen that decoupling happening. Well, Sweden is, of course, a, probably the most brilliant example, followed by probably by Denmark. <clears throat> um, well, others are, are doing much, not, not that well, but just can, can show France, for example, or, or, or Germany. Um, and there is this very discussion, can we have economic growth with, without emission? Well, yes, if we change the technological uh, base on one side, that's first. Second, if we may reconsider what, we, what the composition of this is, and what kind of elements we want to grow within this GDP? Do we want to grow with more consumption? And in a way, the problem actually, it's not only the emission linked to the production in Europe, but as well the imported goods we import from elsewhere. You know, for example, when you look at the French emission per capita, uh, when you count in the imported emission like a, 
the High Council has produced a, a recent report on that to double this emission. So can we do without that? Uh, one, of course, I would say changing the, the energy base, going to clean energy, electrifying the whole use of energy. But at the same time, we have to modify how behaviors. We know that we have to modify how um, food consumption if we want to uh, really protect forest in particular and to consume less energy. We need, need certainly to have a more frugal way of life in exchange of a better life, more healthy life, more health in our cities, less noise and less of air pollution, and, uh, and probably more consumption of immaterial goods. And, uh, and so that the central discussion, which is super difficult, but I see that some, in some countries now the discussion is going public not only between a circular specialist. I see Netherlands working very, very strongly on how we count differently GDP, or what we can read of this particular narrow notion. So that's, I think, the main challenge. And it's a battle within the community of the economists. It's not one, and by far. So most of them think that growth is a precondition, and growth is linked to, for, in the co traditional concept, is linked to more emissions. So. Um, so that's something where we have to innovate deeply. Thank you very much. So we have uh, next question. Please go ahead. You, you are yeah being asked to, to go to the mic, sending mic on your left. Thank you. Um, thank you very much as well. So my question is about the UK as COP host for next year. Um, and obviously, it was one of the first major economies to set a net zero target. And we've seen the effects of that recently and today in South Korea. But it's really quite off track with its carbon budgets. Um, and it's going to quite soon be having to make some quite drastic policy decisions if it, wants to remain, if it wants to remain on track. And at least in the UK, there's very little public participation in that. And I wonder what you think about the effect that that has and the impact that has on climate diplomacy if we are setting very high targets and encouraging other countries to do the same, but not walking the talk when it comes to having meaningful engagement with the public about those difficult decisions and whether that undermines those big decisions. Um, and yeah, so that's essentially it. Thank you for that question. You know, that's a long going debate among the climate diplomats, the, the scientists. Should we put very high target and, in a way, discourage everybody because we don't know how we get there, or at the contrary, having high targets and try to, through a learning process, to modify our understanding of things and processes and pathways? When you look at the story of the climate negotiation and diplomacy, you look at Kyoto Protocol, in a way, concept. The process of Kyoto Protocol is absolutely incremental change with an idea, probably an utopia, that the carbon market would make the progressive the adjustment of this progressive, relatively modest target, and that over time, the system will change because of the uh, growing carbon price that would adjust and reallocate the factor of production and, and the behaviors over time. Why, finally, as it hasn't worked for many reasons, well, sovereignty, uh, headwind from the political just level, and because the signal were too weak, and because there was no, and because in my view, uh, investment in this low carbon economy is not a short term investment. Um, you take any sectors, energy, automotive, many of them, the embedded emission are huge. You, you can't change from the overnight the processes. And so that's why you have so strong vested interest fighting to maintain the structure, because that's where they make profit uh, as if they have not been changing. So that's why we shift from, and it was a very constant shift. We shift from an incremental without specific target, but relying on policy instrument to get the job done on climate change to we need objectives and we need to have them very long as well, 
because we have to sh shape the expectation. So that's the theory behind the net zero. Uh, when when I, I remember this famous Saturday morning when I present that to the major emerging countries that I wanted to put this net zero emission in the Paris goal, in the article, in the main articles. Um, that was strange because I think most of the countries didn't get it. So what it was, the meaning was it. And, and some were, in a way, they didn't give it many, many attention, fortunately, in a way, like, like the article on finance. But then progressively, in a way, you, you know, uh, this expectation begin to uh, really be owned or believed by more and more actors. And then it's like the bankruptcy that uh, famous sociologists have described. You can have the bankruptcy if you a self-fulfilling prophecy of bankruptcy if everybody thinks that the bankruptcy will happen. I consciously made the, the net zero in Paris to have a self-fulfilling prophecy of this will be an expectation that other countries, other actors will believe in. At that time in Paris, it was not the case. Nobody just get, got it. Minus NGOs, of course, and the small and vulnerable countries. So. It's a long response, but why we have this net zero is because of that. You have to shift the thinking. Energy companies, and you see these days, the share, the, the price of the share of most of the oil companies are going down. Uh, Exxon has been just kicked out, uh, Dow Jones. Uh, that's the same for BP, Shell, even Total. Why? Because people feel that they will be stranded assets in the future because they can't be net zero by 2015. Oh, that for the lying hypothesis assumption. But again, it's important to, and I suggest you, you think and you work on that, how the perception, the representation have a really strong role in the global, global governance. Now, UK. Uh, I was discussing with your prime minister, with your prime minister, if you are an English citizen, which I assume, but I'm not so sure. But uh, with Boris Johnson Monday, and um, well, he is now just taking to terms that he has to do something strong now on climate because the COP is arriving and it's his his chance to maintain a global Britain, as as you know, he, he won. <clears throat> and uh, and yes, he doesn't have a clear view of where to go to net zero. But he has a number of people in the country that have a good idea of it. And in a way, we can recognize that UK is the first country that, from being a very coal-based coal based energy user, has phased out almost completely coal. I hope they will not open the new mine, by the way. So I think the high target is very useful. But again, it's not a given. It's not a peaceful pathway, a promenade. It's a fight from many. And uh, I think I would have liked to see more publicity to the citizen assemblies that took place in UK. There will be one more in Scotland. I think the citizens are behind the transformation. They are afraid of the consequences of them. That's why social justice, we have to have that discussion much more strongly. But I, I do think that it's not because government and the short-term vision of government doesn't know that the process is not going. And then you have to make them accountable that their decision is not consistent. That's why your um, climate change committee is so important, by the way, in UK, which I think I recommend every country has one. Thank you very much. We have still at least two students willing to ask questions. I've seen the lady here. Please, go ahead. Thank you very much for your very interesting lecture. I don't have a technical question. Um, I would like to come back to your comment on the situation in Poland regarding abortion rights. You said, and I think it's very true, that climate change is an inclusive issue. How would you see climate change and feminism intertwined? What do you think would be the links? What would you think would be the strength? And what do you think we should fight for in the future? Thank you very much. Uh, there is um, two little anecdotes on the climate diplomacy. 
which I, I want to share, or the role of women in there, which is not, of course, something, a strong response to your question, I'll try to respond more seriously. Um, in, in the climate negotiation, you know, there was at the same time a lot of egos and um, even Christiana Figueres, a former executive secretary of UNFCCC, say, what is nice in the biodiversity convention is about ecosystems, whereas because maybe because it's energy and very male dominated, the UNFCCC convention is about ego system, a lot of egos, a lot of people or head of states that want to save the planet. Well, at the end of the day, women had cleaned the mess. And I can recognize that all my colleagues, uh, women's colleague in the diplomatic sphere has been very, very helpful to all, all, all of us. We have been working very hard to get the mess really solved. And I, I recognize an immense role of many women in, for Paris uh, achievement. I can name many, many of them. Well, I do think feminism in these cases could be, again, well, of course, there are all sorts of feminism. And, and, and of course, currents and thinking and theories. Uh, and so I don't have a, a definitive view. I'm working on that, by the way, because I found that I was too ignorant about the different currents too, and how it really links things to my own work. But I think that the concept of um, the relation to property, domination, uh, appropriation, yes, uh, um, privatization at the same time, and the sentiment of the collective and the inclusiveness. I think feminism could bring something to the discussion. On the other side, as you know, women are very affected by climate change and the role of them claiming for climate justice is very strong. So there is a whole area, uh, and again, I'm. I'm really not the best place to respond to you, but I think it's a very interesting sort of field of, and many of my women colleagues are working very strongly with original ideas to that. And I can, I can tell that works, at least this, this sisterhood on climate diplomacy and action and campaigns work, and it's, it's good to see. But again, that, that's a theoretical field I'm unable to to, invent, to respond to because not, I'm not competent, but I would see studies on that very interesting as, as a contribution. Thank you very much. So we have, I think, last but, but one question. Last question will be yours or mine. We'll see. Thank you for um, the lecture. My question goes a little bit in the same direction because you mentioned that it's important not to leave um, certain groups of the society out of um, the discussion about climate change. And you also mentioned the citizen dialogues that are held in, in different countries. So my, quest oh, yeah, my question is, um, what is your impression? Do the governments in these countries do enough to include um, as many parts of the society as possible. And it's not only about gender, in my opinion, but also about class and uh, social economic background, maybe even, in my opinion, more important than gender in this case. So yeah, do governments do enough to have um, diverse uh, citizen di dialogues? Uh, <clears throat> thank you for, for your question. Um... I, well, first response, no, I don't think enough. I think our democracies in many, many of our countries are obviously in crisis. The level of distrust uh, of citizens vis-a-vis -vis their representation is very, very deep. There is very few citizens in Europe that trust their public institutions, their governments their elected representative, even the media. Um, so we, we have an enormous problem there. We, we of course, see exploding in the United States. Uh, so one, the only solution, in my view, to save our democracy and not to, in a way, consent to authoritarian regimes, which unfortunately 
are not a minority at global level these days. And there is a trend, of course, I don't know if it's a real trend or we, but at least there is, is a case this would be more efficient or more, uh, but because it's that are nurtured by the crisis of our democracy as well. So we have to defend it. Uh, I'm, I, I really, it's a, a crucial moment and it's a crucial moment in particular for Europe. Again, let's see what happened in US after the result of the election. But we may see uh, extraordinary instability because one camp will not accept the result finally. <clears throat> and so that is a, basically the crisis of demo, the representative classical democracy. Yeah. Look at Tocqueville, no? the, he was an admirer of the American democracy and, and he may see these days, he would, I think, wake up in horror of looking at what is happening there. But that because of the process of the distrust. And in my view, the problem is of the distrust and, and many political appointees, representative are complaining about this distrust. People are not trusting them and, and they are complaining about that distrust. But the mistrust is constructed as well because they don't trust most of the time their citizen to be sensible person that could discuss and be responsible citizen. Uh, it's very interesting to see how every country differently, by the way, has managed the COVID crisis, of course, with different circumstances and different severity of the crisis. So I would say no, there is a, uh, but the problem is uh, as much the distrust of government vis-a-vis -vis a citizen that the other way around, and the government are not doing enough by far. But that's, in my view, the only solution is to develop this develop deliberative democracy articulated with a representative one. And I see, at least in Ireland, it was a, a, a hope, no? You, you, you saw the citizen assembly uh, arguing about the uh, abortion rights and the uh, same-sex marriage and climate change. By the way, there were all the three questions and the revision uh, of the law in Ireland. And finally, the proposal of the citizen assembly were finally totally mirrored by the referendum that took place after. So, so they are promising experience. And sometimes government feel they can't solve the situation if they don't give access to the decision-making citizen. And I hope this will be generalized, but we have to make the theory of it as well. Because if not, it's like the economic growth and the zero emission. There will be always people saying it's not possible. It's against every standards or criteria for a sound democracy. We have to show that's not. We need rules, we need processes, but that's a very, very big field and it's not only experiences, we have to have the institution in place to do that. So that's your job now to produce it. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have you, your signal. Okay, so the floor is yours, please. Thank you again. Um, I want to go back to the concept you talked about that um, EU is putting social justice ahead of economic um, and uh, other factors um, now with the recent plan. So I'd like to ask if um, that it is indeed the case, why does EU keep exporting its greenhouse uh, emissions gases ab abroad, especially with several in industries that will not be put into account? Um, how exactly having the industry outside will contribute to social justice, because it's not just about having European workers um, transitioning. It's also about having the places in the world that we affect transitioning. Um, I believe that saying that outcome doesn't matter, what matters is say, and uh, that, that um, the outcome doesn't matter, what matters um, is the process. Um, I understand what you said by that, but I don't, I, I don't think that's a fair, that's a fair um, con conclusion to take, because uh, the process has been going on for 30, 40 years since Kyoto, and we are at the same stage, so I'd like to ask you, what you mean exactly by social justice and how you is dealing with it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I, am, I am happy you disagree. That's good. Um, one, uh, of course, I insist on processes matter because I think processes matters. But of course, we the problem climate change doesn't care about processes. It's just happening. 
So outcome is uh, really important. So you're right in a way. So globalization has, um, has led to, it's not only the delocalization of industry who has created the, the fact that we are putting our emission even more than we are emitting on our soil. Uh, it's partly that, but not really. It's not about climate laws or climate regulation that industry has been put outside. Uh, basically, it was a difference between the, the wages that has made this happen. And globalization has created as much this enormous increase in consumption, in consumption and access to consumer goods that really are at the same time, the, the, well, the, the base for our excessive emission, well, our emission going up. So uh, at that juncture, so the first social justice was that we have, export, we have exported through our increased consumption in Europe a lot of the pollution outside. We saw that with the waste issue, we saw that with the air pollution, uh, the plastic drama, uh, which is of course polluting all our oceans, but as well the local waters of Indonesia, Vietnam, China, etc., or Pakistan, is as well because we are consuming ourselves a lot of plastics. And that, of course, we have access to very cheap plastic products. That has to stop at one point in time. Of course, we have to stop that. Now, how we rebuild an economic system which more control on globalization, which is needed, that really internalize all these costs, but not only from the price point of view, but regulation point of view as well. And uh, I think it was a good signal that China with, and or India decided not to import any more the waste to do the treatment at home. That really uh, is, is a very good decision and I think it has had a very strong impact on uh, developed economies that has now to deal with the waste. So there is all the system we have to rebuild it and to understand what a just transition means for not only for here in Europe and it's very important here in Europe because I, I do think that it's really important to demonstrate that we can do uh, a low development carbon and that it's possible because for the moment of course there is a lot of question about that so i think the european question and ensuring that there is a voice for the people who be displaced in the automotive industry if we go to electrification of transport or the coal miners or the the so many other sectors that has to move so but we have to solve the question in europe at least to give hopes that it can be sold elsewhere. And then we have to revise our trade relation. We can't just underpay the work of everybody else just to live better. That's a very, very structural question. So for the, until now, the climate change issue was never linked to social dimension, never. The climate justice movement has tried to put this forward with different nuances and, 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 and in a proposal. But we haven't had a, a comprehensive discussion on globalization and social justice in the process of getting to net zero by 2050. That's the discussion of today. I don't have the response myself, but we have to work on that. What are fair trade relations? How we degrow the emission everywhere knowing that we have to offer more space of development for uh, people in Africa, in East Asia, in Latin America that are still struggling for access to basic needs. So well, that's a vast program of reconstruction of the global economy, but we did that in, uh, in 1984, uh, 1948, sorry. And 1944 with the Bretton Woods system and the world system. So we have to rebuild it now. 
uh, it's a really a question of what is a global system look like. We have designed one who seems successful but has a lot of consequences on the, uh, in the, this 20th century, in the midst of it. We have to rebuild it uh, with different base. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I don't see any, I have uh, one student willing to ask the question, please. Um, so I have one very short question. Um, you said uh, that in general, um, like the transition is um, very complex and uh, different parties should be involved in the, in the transition, in the climate transition. But is there any country or any group of countries that we can take as an example to follow? Or is there any country which took already steps which other country should follow? It's not ideal, but it's like... Um, step that we can get closer to uh, transition. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, we have a lot of bad experiences of transition in Europe. Uh, crisis in the industry of steel, for example, or coal in in UK. So that was not a nice one by far. I see uh, maybe two countries I'm trying, that are trying to really address social justice first which is a case in Spain with the cold regions, where I do see that the, the, liber the, consultation, the consultation and the negotiation with the region, in particular the north of Spain, were absolutely uh, really re relying on the coal mines and the coal power plants, are now in the process to phasing them out with the consent, which is really remarkable, of the unions, of the region uh, and trying and the companies trying to move them to other activity, but really having ensured a social safety net first before even engaging the phasing out. So Spain for me, again, we have to study it and to see how it works, is a very, very good example of uh, at least putting social justice first to the transition. I, I know that some region in Poland have been very active in thinking about the transition in Silesia in particular, even if of course it's very difficult. So it would be good to gather experiences. Uh, the failed one, we know them. It was really the crisis of many, many industries in, European, in Europe that we have many examples that really uh, have crashed totally, living spaces that even now didn't recover. But, um, yeah, I would say Spain and Portugal in a way, but Spain in particular because of this heavy coal. Uh, again, the coal example in UK, coal has, UK is phasing out coal really, but the, the consequences of the workers and the miner have been really, really dire. So I don't think it's a good example. So we have another question, please. Thank you very much. Um, uh, you mentioned um, uh, trade regime and climate regime that are very different, yet they are very interconnected. So my question, what is the role of trade unions uh, regarding the climate transition? And leads me to the second question. Um, we know that the, the pandemic crisis um, had very bad consequences on the neighboring countries of the European Union. And basically, um, these neighboring countries were given a big role in the climate transition and the energy governance. So do you think that, in your perspective, that they are um, able to live up to the challenge given by the EU in these uh, very bad circumstances? And especially that these neighboring countries are in a democratic transition since the last 10 years. Thank you. Well, big question. Um... Big question. Um, when the, again, there are these two regimes are or will be practically are interconnected de facto because the liberalization of trade and the trade agreements have, of course, um, organized the production and the development of production lines 
sometimes very heavily relying on fossil fuels in different regions. And, uh, and it's not only Europe, it's as well, when I look at the Belt and Road Initiative of China, uh, was the same, no? It, outside investment that finally, uh, for trade reason, from, from the Chinese point of view, access to roads, access to, to maritime traffic, etc. So, uh, how to, we can't make the transition in our close borders without understanding the impact on others. That's for sure. That will not work because, again, the emissions of Europe per se are not that high. And again, if I look at the neighboring countries, uh, of course, borders are the, the closest to Europe. But in a way, when again looking at this interesting initiative of the Chinese investment, <clears throat> you could derail all effort to go to fossil fuel in this region without and going clean in Europe. So that would not make sense at all. So can we have a concerted, so for the moment, politically, it was impossible to link the two regimes for a very strong opposition of everybody, you know, the, the people specialized in trade, the trade unions, the developing countries government, uh, People were very jealous of protecting trade from any impact on anything because they just wanted trade to develop and liberalization to happen. And, and that was very isolated. Even in the European, it's very isolated. Uh, you can have a, a concept that we, we want to have a sustainable trade agreement, but the people negotiating trade for the moment don't, don't believe in it. So it's ingrained, no? it's really embedded that trade has to be isolated. But we have to, this will be broken by the increasing contradiction into having stronger regulation at EU level and letting the border open. But again, so for me, uh, and just maybe making the case for a discussion around the carbon, the border tax adjustment, which is so en vogue, and will be uh, in a way discussed on the next semester in 2021. I do think that we should not use that as a protectionism, but really as a way to discuss cooperation uh, 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 along trade, the trade regime. Uh, it's interesting because these these hours, I think, with these days, last day, I haven't followed closely. Um, government will decide who will be the next director of WTO. Interesting that some women competing, in particular one very, very clever and forceful, um, which is really uh, coming from Nigeria. Um, and this person um, is uh, a, a deep activist in climate change and have been really instrumental in pushing African government to consider climate change as really a major risk. So I was communicating with her. I don't know, finally, she will be elected or somebody else, because they are competitors, of course. But uh, it will be really interesting to have, for the first time, uh, um, a leader in the trade regimes that one understand climate change and thinks that it is regimes that has to be linked together. Again, it will be a strong innovation. We have been negotiating since the 80s to try to link them. It was impossible because of the resistance of the trade regime in particular. And, uh, and you can understand developing countries who wanted to get the market open and were afraid of climate policy being a way of protectionism. Even in Paris Agreement, we have to agree that there will be no trade in a provision in the Paris Agreement, and they are not. We, we had to keep far from it. So uh, that's just, again, a, a new area. Uh, and it will be very interesting to, in a way, enlarge the vision of the transition, at least to the neighboring countries, to embark them together. We are not there. Huh? OK, thank you very much. So I don't see any 
more questions from students and uh, I, I'm afraid we don't have time me to ask the question. I have plenty of them. So uh, let me summarize by saying that uh, I think this, this, this lecture, thank you very much, uh, Laurence, for, for providing this lecture to the students, to us, for, for enlightening us and giving us this opportunity to uh, to have uh, this uh, uh, very deep insight information from your side and for sharing it with, with, with us. Uh, we are uh, in the process general, in, in the college general, dealing with the transition since a very long time. So the transition in the political terms, economic terms, uh, is something which is at the very heart of this institution. And I'm very keen that this climate transition, uh, again, is uh, something which uh, can be added to this very broad spectrum of, of, of transition concept as such. The, the, uh, the College of Europe, not only in campus, uh, is dealing and will be dealing uh, for sure in the future. That is the reason why uh, that is information for you, uh, the students who are organized in uh, um, energy and climate nests decided to organize in June next year a conference on the just transition in the context of climate change and this conference is going to elaborate many concepts you have um, elaborated today on and thank you very much for, for broadening and deepening uh, this concept of inclusiveness uh, of uh, women participation, of equal rights, of, uh, of uh, not uh, leaving anybody behind. There are many, many concepts and all of those concepts will be probably taken into account uh, while preparing this conference to be, to be organized uh, next year. And uh, I see that this concept is much broader than the concept of dealing with the coal regions is much broader than uh, dealing with some industries or branches. That's something which uh, is at the very heart of the, uh, the process of democratic acceptance for the change which is uh, going to, uh, we are going to witness in, in, in years to come. So uh, thank you very much for, for, for that. Thank, thank you for your um, a deep and a comprehensive uh, presentation of your views on so many aspects, including the development of the European Union policy, this international government on climate change, on the social uh, uh, dialogue on the on the uh, on the climate change uh, at, in, in France. Uh, uh, so that that is all elements we are taking with us. Uh, and uh, for sure they will be uh, elaborated on further in the, in the way of preparation to this conference to, uh, we are going to have next year on climate uh, just transition uh, here at the Natalin campus of the College of Europe. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Madam Vice-Rector, for giving us this opportunity. And I hope, thank you students for asking the questions for for being with us and thank you very much for those who are with us through through internet through streamline so thank you very much once again and i hope we'll see you soon at the, another uh, round of the climate transition uh, lecture series here at the natal campus of the college of europe thank you very much